okay, I guess we'll get started. Uh, let me just uh, quickly check if everything's up. Uh, this one, okay. All right. Okay, so we were talking about the arithmetic types last day. Uh, and now we need to uh, discuss uh, um, conversions between the different arithmetic types. All right, so you've actually seen these before in Java, right? So broadly speaking, uh, the way C converts um, between the arithmetic types is similar to the way that Java uh, converts types, right? So when you write an expression like um, z equals x plus y, right? Then it's the types of x and y that determine how the operation is performed, right? So if x and y are both ints, then it's int arithmetic, right? Now the question is what happens when x and y have different types? What type of operation is performed, right? So broadly speaking, um, the narrower type is converted to the wider type. Right? So if x is, for example, um, an int, and y is a long, then the value of x gets promoted to long, and then long arithmetic gets performed. Right? So that's broadly speaking what happens. Now, there's a problem in C. Uh, well, compared to Java, the rules for conversion are more complicated, because C has these unsigned types. Right? There's another problem. C doesn't actually specify um, the sizes of the types, right? It only specifies the ordering of the types, right? Uh, so the result of what happens when you convert between types um, is very can be very different in C compared to Java. All right, so these are just the integer types that we're talking about for the time being, okay? So every integer type has what's called a conversion rank, right? So from top to bottom, right, we're going down in rank. So long, long int has the highest. Uh, long, long int, along with unsigned long, long int, they have the highest uh, have the highest rank. Right, long int and its unsigned variation, next highest rank. Right, int and unsigned int, next highest rank, and so on. Bool has the lowest rank because it's only zero and one. Right, uh, so notice that the signed and unsigned variants, right, they have I, they have equal ranks. Okay. When performing an arithmetic op, when performing arithmetic with a type whose rank is less than the rank of int, right? So any of these things in red, right? A process called integer promotion occurs, right? So if you have, uh, if you're trying to do arithmetics with two cars or two signed cars or two unsigned cars, right? Or two shorts, right? Uh, then integer promotion automatically occurs. Right? So integer promotion is the process of converting. Oh wait. These red things are called the small types, right? They're smaller than int. Uh, so integer, integer promotion is the process of converting a small type to int or unsigned int when performing an arithmetic operation, right? Now, why does this happen, right? Because int is the optimal type uh, on your architecture for performing integer arithmetic. Right, so that's one reason, right? So instead of trying to perform arithmetic with smaller values, Right? If you convert them automatically to the, uh, to the int type, then you can optimize that operation uh, on your hardware. Right? The other thing you get is that it prevents um, intermediate overflow errors. Right? So if you're, per if you're performing arithmetic with the small types, right, you have to remember the range is very small, especially on car. Right? So a car is only between minus 128 and 127. So if you're doing some kind of arithmetic, it's very easy to overflow the range of car. Right? So instead, what happens is the cars get promoted up to int, the arithmetic gets, hap gets performed in int, and then the result gets um, demoted back down to car. Right? So here's an example where I'm trying to do some arithmetic with signed car. Right? So I'm using, uh, so here's limits. Right? So limits defines the um, upper and lower bounds for all of the integer types. Right? Uh, inside limits, there's a constant called s car max. Right? That's just the maximum short value. Uh, the maximum, sorry, the maximum signed car value that you can have, right? And then I just define some, uh, de define some values, right? So C1 is 100, 
its type is signed car. Right? C2 is 50, its type is signed car. Right? And n is 2, right? also signed car. OK, so the maximum value of uh, s car, sorry, the maximum value of signed car on my computer is 127, I believe. So this is, um, which one is this? Uh, I forget which one this is called. This is promotion? OK, so cat promotion. Whoops, there we go again. Cat promotion.c. OK, this is the one. Right. So this is going to print out the, vac the maximum value of signed car. So that's 127 on my computer. Right. If I compute 100 plus 50, right, that's 150, which is bigger than 127. Right. So that C1 plus C2 uh, will overflow if the arithmetic is performed in signed car. Right. So C1 plus C2, but if I divide it by 2, right, so 100, 150 divided by 2, that's 75. Right, the answer fits into the range of signed car. Right? So here's a computation where the intermediate result, C1 plus C2, overflows the range, but the final result fits in the range. Right? If C performs this in signed car, you're going to get overflow, and then the answer is going to be wrong. Right? But because of promotion, C1 gets converted to int, C2 gets converted to int, the 2, oh, wait, that should be n, sorry, but it doesn't matter. The 2 gets converted to an int. Right? Everything happens in int arithmetic, and then the result gets converted back down. So this actually works, right? You actually get the correct average value of 75. Right? So there's an example of what happens when you use a short type um, to perform arithmetic. Right? The same thing happens in Java, but in Java, the conversion back down doesn't happen automatically always, uh, which is super annoying. OK. All right, now what happens if you have mixed types? Right? So you have a x plus y, or x minus y, or x is greater than y, right? Uh, and they have different types, right? Then, um, so in that case, uh, one or both of the operands get converted in some, uh, in some way. So the steps you follow um, are these four steps in order. Right? So you have to go in order, right? So if one of the operands has type long double, something happens. Uh, and then the rest of the calculation happens, right? Otherwise, if one of the operands has type double, something happens, right? Otherwise, if one of the operations has type float, something happens, right? Otherwise, both operands um, are some type or some integer type, something happens, right? Okay, cases one, two, and three. So these shouldn't surprise you because these are more or less the same as what happens in Java. Right? Uh, so if one of x and y has type long double then the other operand gets converted to long double. Right? So everything happens in the larger type. Right? If one of, uh, otherwise, if one of x and y has type double, then the other one gets converted to double. Right? It doesn't matter what the type of the other one is. Right? If it's an int or a floating point, it gets converted to double. Otherwise, if one of x and y has type float, then the other operand is converted to float. Right? And this one, so actually these two, two and three, um, uh, that sh those should throw up red flags for you, right? So um, on my computer anyway, and on most, uh, most of your computers, uh, int and float have the same number of bits. Okay. Uh, but int has a, uh, but the, there are values of int that you cannot represent exactly in float, right? Because uh, if you remember from 124, uh, a float has uh, two parts to it, right? It's got the significant, and it's got the exponent. So some of the bits in the number go to represent the exponent, which means there are some integer values that are in int that you cannot fit into float. Right? You can't represent them exactly in float. Right? So when this conversion happens, there's a loss of information. Right? Double has the same problem with long. Right? Long and double usually take up 64 bits, uh, most of your desktop computers. Right? But some of the bits in the double are used to represent the exponent. Right? which means only the remaining bits are left to represent the integer part of the number. Right? So that means there are long values that cannot be exactly represented in double. So again, you're going to have loss of information there. OK, so here's a fairly long and hard to read example. Um, I think I told you that limits contains all of the numeric limits. That's not true. Um, float is the header file that you need if you want the floating point limits. Right? So limits just includes the integer limits. 
Float includes the limits for uh, float, double, and long double. All right, so let's take this uh, part line at a time. Uh, so I've got x has type long double, right? y has type double, and I'm going to add them together. Right? And I'm going to store the result in a long double to make sure that I can store the result. Right? Well, hopefully I can store the result. OK, so long, uh, x has the value double max, right? so the largest double value that you can represent. y has the value double max. Right? So x plus y should be two times double max. Right? Now, I I'm using long double, so hopefully it fits into the result. Okay. I'm going to print out the result. So I'm going to print out what double max is. And I'm using LE for the conversion here. Right? So LE means convert that number there. Right? So the conversion is E. So that's uh, similar to F. So it's floating point. But this is going to use exponential notation to print the result. Right? So it's going to print the result as something decimal something times 10 to the something. Right? Uh, you need the L because um, we're using doubles here, right? not floats. Big LE. Right? You need the big L if you have a long, long type. Uh, sorry, if you have a long double type. Right? So now I need big L and then E. So I'm going to use exponential notation to write out the result as well. OK, so let's just run this one first. Um, now we have two mixed types, right? long double and double. So I think what should happen is the value of Y should get promoted to long double, and then the whole result should be computed in long double. So let's see if that happens. Uh, now what do you think this one's called? Uh, uh, F mixed types. Okay, so let me um, do that. All right, so we, it's the first two lines that we're interested in. All right, so double max is uh, 1.8 times 300, uh, 1.8 times 10 to the 308. All right, if I multiply that by two, right, I'm going to get 3.6 ish times 10 to the times 10 to the 308. All right, so that seems to work. Right? There doesn't seem to be any overflow that's happened there. So the next example, I've got y, which is a double. Right? And I'm going to put the value of float max into y. Right? And then I'm going to add y and z. So z is also float max. Right? So when I add y and z, if no overflow occurs, right, I should get 2 times float max. Right? And let's go back here. Right? So it's the next two lines. Right, so float max is 3.4 times 10 to the 38, and the sum is twice that. So that looks like that worked as well. No overflow. Um, Z is short max. OK, so this is the, now I'm taking a short and, um, oh, this is rule, oh, this isn't relevant because this is using short. I don't know why this is here. Um, but anyway, it seems to work. Right, so Z. Uh, is of type, where is Z? Z? Z's a float, right? So I'm going to put a short max, I'm going to put the sh value of short max into the float. I'm going to set uh, S, which is short, right, to short max, and then I'm going to add them together, right? If the arithmetic happens using short, it's going to overflow, right? Does it overflow? And the answer is no, right? So short max is uh, 32,767. But because the computation happens in float, you can actually compute the correct value um, of 65,534. OK. So that's cases 1, 2, and 3. Right? If both operands are of integer type, then integer promotion is applied, if required. Right? So if you're taking x plus y and they both have some integer type, then you go back to here. Uh, and you look at the integer promotion slide, right? So if one of the values is short, some promotion happens. I, I guess that's why that, that example's here. OK, so what's actually happening here then? Uh, no, this, no that, that's fine. They're both, uh, one's, a float, one, one's a floating point type, one's an integer type. So short, max, short gets promoted up to float. OK, case four is where both, integer, uh, both operands are of integer type, right? So first you apply promotions. Right, so if you have two integer types um, that are different and they're small types, they both get promoted up to int. Right? And then the following happens. Right, so this is what happens when you use mixed integer operands. Right, so this is the case where you have one of your operands is floating point. Here is where they're both integer. Right, so after promotion happens, 
Uh, conversions are automatically applied, and this time there's five separate cases. And this is to deal with the fact that some uh, that you have the unsigned integer types. Okay. Now, normally after promotion, your two operands will have the same type. Uh, will both be int, right? Um, so x and y have the same type. Nothing else happens, right? Because they have the same type. Um, if x and y are both signed, or they're both unsigned, something happens, right? Otherwise. If the rank of the unsigned operand is greater than or equal to the rank of the signed operand, something happens. Right? Otherwise, if the signed operand type can represent all the values of the unsigned operand type, something happens. And then finally, case 5 happens. Right? So if none of these are true, then you fall into case 5. All right, so case 1, x and y have the same type, nothing happens. Right? There's no, you don't have to convert them because they have the same type. Case 2. X and Y are both signed types, right? Or they're both unsigned types, right? So they're both signed or both unsigned. So what happens is you promote up to the um, uh, you promote up to the to the higher rank, right? So the operand with the lower rank gets converted to the one with the higher rank, right? Which is just a widening conversion. So that makes sense too, right? Case three: uh, if the unsigned operand has rank greater than or equal to the signed operand. Right? So the unsigned one has the, same, has the rank that is equal to or greater, then you convert the signed operand. Right? You convert the signed operand to the type of the unsigned operand. Right? So there's a table back here that shows the ranks. Here. Right? Uh, but, 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 right. OK, so if you add an int and an unsigned int together, right? you add these two together, they have the same rank. So the unsigned int. Uh, is the type that takes precedence. Right? So you take the int and you convert it to an unsigned int value and then you do the arithmetic. Right? That should also throw up red flags. Right? Uh, so the results are often very surprising if the signed operand is negative. Right? Um, do, you, do you understand why it's surprising if the, un, if the um, signed operand is negative? Anybody? Anybody? So if you have a negative number, um, it's two's complement, right? Which bit do you know for sure is one? Anybody? Any? Yep. Yeah, the leftmost bit is one, right? So if you've got a four-bit number, right, that's, that's assigned, then the first bit is a one. Right? So if you convert this to an unsigned value, right, that one stays the same, right? So you're just going to interpret this now as an unsigned value, right? That's some big unsigned, positive unsigned value, right? It's not negative anymore, right, when you convert it to the unsigned type. It's now some very large unsigned value because the leading bit's one, right? And now you're going to add them together in unsigned and you're going to get a very strange result. Right? No, you're not going to get a negative result in otherwise. Right? OK, case four. If the signed operand type can represent all the values of the unsigned type, right, then you convert the unsigned type to the signed type. Right? Now, that, now you don't have to worry about the uh, fact that you're converting a signed value to an unsigned value. Right? This only occurs when the signed type is wider than the unsigned type. So for example, if you're adding a negative int, sorry, when you have an, when you have an int and you're adding uh, an unsigned short, for example. Right? So then the unsigned short gets promoted up to int. OK, case five occurs when all the other cases don't apply. Right? So if you have two types, that, so when can this occur? You have two types that are represented with the same number of bits. Right? And the signed operand has greater rank than the unsigned operand. Right? Uh, so this is a little bit unusual, but we'll see an example of this shortly. Okay? So what happens here is that both operands are converted to the unsigned type again. Right? Uh, and again, if, one of your num if your assigned number happens to be negative, you're going to get a very weird result. Okay, so here's some examples. Case 2, 3, and 4. Right? So case 2, I've got a long int plus an int. Right? So int max and int max, but uh, but, but the first one is stored in the long int. Okay, I compute the sum, right? 
Now, if the sum's done using integer arithmetic, it's going to overflow because I'm using int max for the value. Right? Um, so if it doesn't overflow, we know that uh, we know that the right conversion has happened. So this is mixed types. Right? So there's int max. The sum is twice the value of int max. Right? So we know that the sum has been computed correctly without overflow. So that's good. Uh, here's case three. So I have an unsigned int plus an int. Right? So here's my unsigned int. It's int max. Right? And then I'm going to add one to it. Right? Now remember, the unsigned types, they can hold larger values. Right? The maximum value of the unsigned type is larger than the maximum value of the signed type. Right? So when I compute 1 plus z, this should be OK. Right? Should be OK. So is it? So there's int max, right? 2, 1, 4, 7, 4, 8, 3, 6, 4, 7. When I add 1 to it, right, and one of the types is unsigned, is unsigned int, right? Then I get the correct result. Right? So if you go back here, so if uh, z was of type int, right, and you add 1 to int max, then you get overflow, right? You get negative, uh, what, what, you'll get int min in this case, right? So the largest negative minimum value. Or I guess the minimum value with the largest magnitude. Case four. So here's where we have unsigned short plus int. Right? Unsigned short plus int. Um, is this the weird one? Unsigned short and int. OK, so this should work, I think. Right, so why is unsigned short max? Right? And why is a int? Right? So that should fit into an int. Uh, unsigned short s is unsigned short max. Right, so this, hopefully, the sum gives me twice the value of unsigned short max. Right, and it does. Right, so short, unsigned short max is 65535. Five. The sum is twice that. So everything works. Right, so nothing surprising happens on this slide. Right, everything, the conversions happen the way they're described. The results are all correct. Or the results are the ones that you expect. Oh, what just happened? Hmm. OK. Now, the unsigned conversions um, is where weird stuff happens. Right, so here, I've got an unsigned int. Right? I have the largest value of uh, unsigned int stored in this value. Right? Now I've got a signed car whose value is minus 1. Right? I've got a signed car whose value is minus 1. And then here, I've got some arithmetic operation. Here, it's just comparison. Right? It's not even addition or subtraction or multiplication or anything like that. Right? It's pure comparison. So the conversion rules still apply. Right, so what do the conversion rules say here? Well, I've got an unsigned type right, whose rank is higher than the signed type. Right, so unsigned int has a higher rank than signed car. Right, so the value of signed car, or C, gets promoted up to unsigned int. Right? Signed car has a negative 1, right, or its value is negative 1. Right? So you know it's leading bit is a 1. Right? Um, because it's minus 1, you also know that all the other bits are 1. Right? So when you do the promotion, right, does this actually print out um, d? So does it actually print out, is that value, that value and that value are equal? And the answer is yes. It does print that out. Right? So this is, what is this? Uh, unsigned conversion. Right. Minus 1 is apparently equal to 429, 496, 7295. Right. Which is probably not the you were expecting, right? but that's the way it works. Right. Because this number gets promoted up to int, uh, up to unsigned int, right? the fact that there's a Right. The fact that the representation of negative 1 is all 1s in binary, right? when you convert that up to a larger type, you get all 1s. Right? So all 1s in the unsigned type is the largest value of the unsigned type, right? which is why that prints out that those are, in fact, equal. Right? But probably not what you were expecting. Right? So you have to be very careful when you do these comparisons. The compiler doesn't tell you that you're doing this comparison. Right? There's no warning given to you at all that this is happening. Right? The, pro the C language assumes you know what you're doing. Right? And it will let you do whatever you write. Right? So if you write, is C equal equal to UI, 
the compiler will happily compile it and run the result. Right? So you have to be very careful when you're working with these when you're working with assigned to unsigned conversions. OK, so what are, what are the safe conversions? So the safe conversions are any of the conversions that happen where you don't lose any information and you don't get a strange result. Right? So if you have a signed integer of a smaller type, you can always convert that to a signed integer of a larger type. Right? So you can always take a signed car and convert that up to signed int without any problems. Right? You can do the same thing with the unsigned types. Right? If I have unsigned car, I can always promote it up to uh, signed, uh, unsigned int without any issues. Right. Float is always safely convertible to double or long double. Double is always safely convertible to long double. Any other conversion might give you a funny result right? or result in loss of information. All right. OK. So when you take a floating point value and convert it to an integer value, what happens? Right? So the following is true except for bool, right? because bool only holds 0 and 1. Right? Uh, so if you take a non-zero value and convert it to bool, the answer is 1. Right? If you take a zero value and convert it to bool, the answer is 0. OK, so if you convert a floating point to some integer type that's not bool, right, what happens is you take everything to the right of the decimal point and throw it away. So you truncate all of the uh, digits after the decimal point, right? And you're left with the whole number part, right? Now, if the whole number part doesn't fit into the integer type, right, then C says the behavior is undefined, right? In other words, it depends on what the compiler implementer has decided to do in this case, right? So anything can happen, right? So for example, if you take a double and you try to convert it to a car, right, um, then uh, the odds are very good that the double value doesn't fit into a car, right? Because car is only minus 128 to 127, right? So if the magnitude of the double number is bigger than is uh, bigger than 128, it definitely won't fit into the car, right? Anything can happen. So here's a little program that converts a float to an int, right? Uh, so here the float value is 1.5. And I'm going to store the value of x in y. Right? Now again, the compiler doesn't warn you that something funny might happen here. Right? It will happily let you store an int, a float into an integer variable. Right? Uh, in Java, you get a, uh, the compiler um, it flags an error. Right? So in Java, if you write that statement, right, it'll tell you that there's a narrowing conversion without a cast. Right? In other words, it'll make you do the cast yourself. Right? C doesn't care. Right? The compiler will let you do this. Everything, it just, it just applies the conversion rules. Right, so we lose the 0.5, and we store the 1 in y. Right, so that's going to work. Now, float max is much bigger than the largest value of int. Right, it's uh, something times 10 to the 38. Right, much, much bigger than um, the largest integer value. Right, so when I store float max in y, again, the compiler doesn't care. It just does it. Right, does it work? Well, it depends. Right? On my computer, it happens to work. Right? So this is uh, float to int. Right? So what happens on my computer is, so the first conversion works, and it should. Right? One definitely fits into int. So get, right, get rid of the decimal point. Everything after the decimal point, store the one. That should work. Float max, when you store that, um, in an int, right? So float max is positive, right? But when you store it in an int, the value becomes negative. Um, so that doesn't work the way you think it ought to work, right? So again, the, the language says anything can happen. Um, just to show you that the compiler doesn't care, right? So the, the compiler is not going to try to save your bacon here, right? It does not care at all, right? There's no warnings, nothing, right? Even if you even if you turn on all warnings, so minus big W all means use all warnings, the compiler doesn't tell you something funny might happen. Right? Everything's a constant here too. Right? These are all constants. Right? That are in this, uh, that are, these expressions are made up of all constants. So the compiler can actually statically analyze this code and tell you that something's going to happen, but it doesn't. Right? OK, integer to floating point. So can you go the other way? 
right? So the answer is yes. Um, so if the value of the integer fits into the range of the floating point type, right, uh, then the integer value gets converted to the closest possible floating point value. Right? It doesn't get converted exactly. It gets converted to the closest possible. Right? So if you try to convert an int to float, there are some int values that are not exactly representable in float, right? even though the largest int value is much smaller than the largest float value. Um, on most architectures, if you try to convert a long to a double, there are some long values that do not fit, uh, that cannot be represented exactly in double, right? So the answer you get is the closest float or double value to that int, sorry, to that long or int value, right? Now, if the value of the integer doesn't fit into the range, uh, then the behavior, again, is undefined, right? Uh, I don't think there's... No, so I don't think there's any examples where the value doesn't actually fit into the range. Right? But there are examples where you cannot exactly represent the number um, in, in the corresponding floating point type. Right? So here's x, it's an int, right? 101. I should definitely be able to represent that as a float. Right? So if I store x into y, which is a float type, x and y should be 101. Now, any large value of x, right? So any value close to int max, that's not going to fit into float exactly, right? So if I compute int max minus 100, right? That is a valid int. It's positive. It's large, right? But that value is not going to fit into, into float. Uh, sorry, that value is not exactly representable as a float, right? So this is going to be int to float. OK, so when I convert 101 to float, that works just fine. Right? When I convert 214-748-3547 to float, it doesn't quite work. Right? Um, so instead of uh, 547, I get 520. Right? So the number on the right, that's the closest floating point value to the integer on the left. Right? And again, it's because uh, float doesn't have enough bits to represent the integer part of the number. Right, because some of the bits of float are used to represent the exponent. OK, floating point to floating point conversion. So this is when you do float to double or double to float. Right? Uh, if the value of the floating point value fits into the range of the target type, then the conversion happens and everything's fine. Right? Uh, sorry, it fits into the range. OK, so if it fits in the range, then the value that you get is the, again, it's the closest floating point value in the target type. Right? Otherwise, again, behavior is undefined. Right? So you might get something sensible, you might not. So here I've got double, and I'm converting it to float. Right? 100.5 definitely fits into the range of float. Right? So this conversion should happen um, without any errors or any loss of information. Right? Now, x is a double, so if I take float max in times 2, right, that will fit in the range of double, but it doesn't fit in the range of float. Right? So when I store x into y, right, anything can happen. Right? And on my computer, uh, you end up with, so there's x and y, so they have the same value. That's good. Uh, there's x, so that's uh, float max, apparently, written out with all of its digits. Right? Uh, sorry, that's 2 times float max. Right? When I store that into a float, I get infinity. Right, which, um, so that's at least sensible, right? I don't get a negative number or something strange, right? At least I get infinity, um, which indicates that um, it's, it does, which indicates that the value that you tried to store is larger than the largest possible value, right? So that's at least sensible, which is good, right? But uh, the standard says you don't always get the sensible behavior, right? Anything's allowed to happen. Okay. Uh, so that's the uh, numeric conversions. That's what you need to know about the numeric conversions. Type qualifiers. OK, so so far, all the types that we've looked at, they've just been plain old types, right? So int, unsigned int, pointer to int, something like that, right? You can qualify the types. So there's four qualifiers you're allowed to use in C, uh, where the fourth one is newish, right? So the fourth one came in in uh, C 2011. Uh, so the four qualifiers that you can use are const, volatile, restrict, and atomic. Right? The only one that we care about is const in this course. Okay? 
Uh, volatile and restrict, uh, these are needed to tell the compiler uh, that it can do something or it can't do something when it tries to optimize the code. Right. Atomic is related to threading, which you'll learn about in uh, operating systems if you take that course. Right. So the third year operating systems course. OK, so we're ter all, we, all we want to talk about today is const. Right. So uh, if you make an object in C, uh, so if you make a variable in C and you say that the variable is const, right? so what that means is you cannot change the value of that variable once it's, given, uh, once it's been initialized. Right? So this is a little bit different than Java. Right? So in Java, you've got these final primitive values that represent constant values. Right? So you can declare a final primitive value, uh, and then later on, you can assign it a value once. Right? So that's what final means in Java. That is not what it means in C. So const is not the same thing. Right? Const means once it's been initialized, its value is finalized. Right? So if you make a variable, a local variable, and you call it const, and you don't give it a value, Right? Its value is probably zero. Right? So you have to, if you want to give it a value, you have to give it a value when you declare the variable. Right? Now, uh, the compiler is allowed to do things with const variables that it can't do with other variables. Right? So one of the things it can do is it can take all of your const variables and stick it somewhere in read-only memory, right? which may or may not happen. It right? depends on your compiler. Right? There may not even be read-only memory. Uh, your compiler may not even create space for read-only memory. Right? It really depends on your compiler and your architecture. OK, so const variables are constant. right? You cannot change their value. So const int i equals 1 right? means that in the main method, i has forever the value 1. Right? So as, uh, the scope of i is the body of the main method. So inside this main method, i is always 1, and you cannot change it. Right? So if you try to compile this program, the compiler will tell you that you cannot assign a value to i. Right, so this is so gcc const c. Right, so this won't compile. You get an error. Right, so your assignment of a read-only variable i is, what, is the error that you get. Right, so you can't change a const value. And the compiler will helpfully uh, tell you that. OK, now you might think that you can circumvent this problem, and you can. Right, because you can take a pointer to the object Right? So you can create a pointer to a const qualified object. Right? So in the previous example, I can get a pointer to i, and then I can use the pointer to change the value. Right? Uh, in the bad old days, the compiler would not tell you that you were doing this. Right? Uh, today, or on any modern-ish compiler, the compiler will warn you that you're, trying to, uh, that you're going to change the value of a const object via a pointer. Right? So a modern compiler will warn you if you try to do this. The standard says that if you do this, so if you ignore the warning, um, anything can happen. Right? So the value of the object might change. The value of the object might not change. The value of the object might change to something that you don't want it to, or the program might crash. Right? Anything can happen. So here's an example. Right? So i is declared to be const. Right? Its value is always 1. But I can make a pointer, right? int star p. Right? So I make a pointer to int. Right? And I can take the address of i, right? Because i points because uh, i is an int object. Right? So I can write that. And then I can dereference the pointer and set the value of i to 2. Right? Um, and then I can print the result of i. Right? So if this works, it's going to print i equals 2. Right? If it doesn't work, it's going to print i equals something else. Right? Uh, in either case, the compiler still accepts this as a legal uh, C program. Right? But it warns you. So I'm going to compile it first. Right? So here you get a warning. Right? So it says, uh, in function main on line 7, column 14, right? the initialization discards the const, call the const qualifier from the pointer target type. Right? So it's trying to tell you you're making a pointer to a constant object, right? but you did not declare the pointer uh, you did not declare, declare, when you made the pointer type, you did not declare the pointer type to be constant as well. Right? So in other words, by doing this, right, you can now use the, the pointer p and change the value of a const object. Right? So it's warning you that this is uh, going to happen, this might happen. Right? It's trying to tell you don't do this, right? but it still compiles your program, and you can still run the program. 
So if you run it on my computer, it happens to work, right? So in fact, i does in fact change the value to 2, right? But that's not the guaranteed behavior, right? So anything can happen. All right. Now, if you want to create a pointer to a const qualified object, you really ought to declare, uh, you really should qualify the pointer declaration with const as well. Right? If you do that, then the compiler will actually prevent you from changing the object pointed to. Right? So the declaration const int star p right, declares a pointer to a constant int object. Right? The location of the const matters. Okay? So const int star p means that p points to a const int object. Right? So p points to a const int object. All right? So if I write this, right, so all I do is change the pointer declaration to const int star p. Right? Now, you have to remember here the pointer is not the thing that's constant in this declaration. Right? It's the thing that the pointer is pointing to that's constant. Right? So I can write const int star p, and then I can assign a value to p. Right? If I wrote const int i, later on I cannot assign a value to i. Right? Because i is the constant object. Here, it's not p that's the constant object. It's the thing that's being pointed to that's the constant object. So I can assign a value to the pointer. Right? So I can write p on the next line. I can write p equals the address of i. And then I can try to dereference the pointer. Right. If you do this, the compiler will not compile your program. So this is const 3. Right. So it tells you there's an error. Right. You're trying to assign uh, read-only location star p. Right. I'm trying to dereference a pointer and assign a value to it, but the thing you're trying to assign a value to is const. Right. So this one refuses to compile, and of course, you can't run it. All right, so remember, this is important. You have to remember what this means, right? So you have to burn this in memory. Const int star p means that the thing pointed to by p is constant, right? You can make a constant pointer instead, right? So if you want the pointer, so if I want the variable p to be constant, right? In other words, I want the pointer to always point to the same object, then you have to place the const somewhere else. Right? So you place the const after the star and before the variable name. Right? So th to read this, it's const p. Right? So now your thing p is the thing that's constant. Right? So int star const p, now I have a constant pointer to an int object. The int object may or may not be constant. Right? Now, because you're declaring a const pointer, you have to initialize it here as well. Otherwise, you can't do anything with it. Right? So I can make p point to some int object, right? and it will always point to some int object. Right? It will always pin to point to that object. Right? There's no way to assign a new, uh, there's no way to make it point to a different object. Right? OK, so here uh, I can write int star const p equals the address of i. Right? That's going to give you a warning, right? because you're making a pointer to an int object. right? You're not making a pointer to a constant int object. Right? Here I'm making a constant pointer to an int object, right? instead of making a pointer to a const int object. Right? So you'll get a warning here. And then on the next line, right, when I try to assign a value to p, that's where the error occurs. Right? Because p is const, so I cannot give it another value. Right? So that's where you get the compiler error. So here you get both. Right? Um, but you really should not have made, uh, you really need to declare that pointer to point to a const object. Right? So here you get the warning. Right? It's the same warning as from before. You're making a pointer to a const object, but you didn't declare a pointer to a const object. Then on the next line, that's where you get the error, where you get an assignment to a const pointer object, which is not allowed. OK, so of course, you can mash the two together. Right? So const int star p const p right, means p is a constant. right? So you can't change the value p once you set it. And uh, int star, so that's a pointer to a const object. Right? So if you want the pointer to be constant and the object pointed to to be constant, it's const int star const p. Right? Um, 
Because the pointer is a constant pointer, you have to assign them the value, right? If you try to use p to change some int, it's not going to work, right? Uh, which I'm not going to bother uh, trying to show you there, right? Um, if you try to, if you just plug that into the previous program and try to change the value of i through p, it won't work. Right? Okay, do I want to do this? Uh, how many more slides do I have? Sorry, if I have, uh, oh, there's only two slides. Let me finish this off. Okay, so uh, operators in C. So happily, you've taken Java, so you know most of the C operators already. Right? They behave uh, more or less the same. Okay? The one notable, well, there's two notable exceptions. One of them is the remainder operator. Right? So in Java, the remainder operator works with the floating point types. Uh, it does not work with the floating point types in C. Right? You can only use the integer types. Uh, you can only take the remainder after division with int types. Integer types, sorry. The other difference is subtle, um, and it's probably not that important to tell you about it right now. The remainder operator is very weird in Java. Um, it's exceptionally strange, um, because the, the answer that's returned uh, depends on the signs of the operands. And the rule that Java uses is very bizarre. It's, I think it's the only language that uses that rule. Um, in C, the sign of the result is always the sign of the first, uh, is always the sign of the dividend, right? So the first number, right? So when you take uh, 10 divided by three, compute the remainder, uh, the sign is gonna be positive, so it's one, right? If you take 10 divided by minus three and take the remainder, it takes the sign of the first number, so it's one, right? Minus 10 divided by three, take the remainder as minus one because the sign comes from the first number, right? And minus 10 divided by minus three, take the remainder. Now this is a bit weird, right? Because you think that minus 10 divided by minus three is three with a remainder of one, but it's not, right? Uh, it takes the sign of the first number, so it's minus one, right? Uh, I don't even know what happens in Java, but the answer is not the same. So the other notable exception is the comparison operators. You can write an expression like x is less than y is less than z in C, but it does not do what you want it to do, right? This is not checking is y greater than x and is y less than z, right? If you want to check if x is less, uh, if y is greater than x and is y less than z, you have to use and, right? So you have to write uh, x less than y and y less than z, right? And Java makes you do this, right? If you try to write, if you try to write if you try to write that in Java, the compiler will complain, right? The C compiler doesn't complain. The C compiler interprets it this way, right? Um, is x less than y? So the answer is zero or one, right? Zero if it's true, one if it's false, right? And then the comparison to z happens, right? So that's checking is z greater than or equal to zero or one, right? Depending on what the value of that is, which is not what you want at all, right? Um, but it works. So that works. The compiler, depending on your compiler settings, will silently compile that and give you some runnable program, right? But it's probably not going to do what you want it to do. You almost never want to write that, right? So you have to be careful about the comparison operators as well, right? It's true for all of them. So x equals equals y equals equals z doesn't mean that they're all the same, right? You have to be careful about that. All right, so that's it for today. Um, and we will pick this up tomorrow.